Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for showing us for this panel uh, as part of the exhibition Terence Gower, the Good Neighbor. Um, um, Terence Gower and Mexican Modernism. We are very glad to have you here. We hope that more people can join us soon. Um, this is being recorded uh, so that we can upload it to our website. I want to thank uh, especially the three speakers we have today and Terence Gower, who is going to be in dialogue with the three speakers. We're going to start with uh, Tatiana Cuevas, director of the Museo Carrillo Gil in Mexico City, uh, Jose Esparza Chongui, the director of Storefront uh, here in New York, and Pablo Landa, an anthropologist and curator. The three of them have worked with Terence Gower in different moments. Um, are very familiar with his work. So the idea of this panel is going to be to comment on some specific pieces by Terence and try to create a dialogue that allows us to understand uh, Terence's relationship with Mexican modernism uh, through the lens of his work, but also the exhibition that we are held in at the American Society. Uh, the show is up until uh, mid-July, July 17th. And we are open Wednesdays to Saturdays from 12 to 6 p.m. I hope you can join us now that things are slowly reopening in New York. Um, it's a beautiful exhibition, and thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being here. So I'm going to, I also want to thank our sponsors, um, the sponsors for this exhibition, the New York uh, Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, the Canada uh, Consulate, the Council for Canadian American Relations, uh, Galeria Labor, Fundación Fumex, uh, the Arte Contemporáneo, and the Arts of the America Circle. Thank you to all of them for supporting this exhibition and our public programming. And so now um, I hope we can start with this informal conversation. Uh, and I want to present Tatiana. Tatiana, it's an honor to have you here and it's uh, a great opportunity to connect the two institutions through the work of Terence, who has done uh, a lot of work about the Carlos Hill exhibition, and you can explain a little bit how it's all connected with our show. I can explain a few words about our exhibition after. Sure. Well, thank Aime, thank Terence for the invitation, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, well, if we can look at the slides. So we can start with some some images. Just leave the, the very first one for a while, and I'll I'll tell you when to change. Um, I'm not sure I can't see them in my computer, so let me know when it's on. There's the elevation of the museum now. Okay, great. Um, so let me know if I get uh, if my audio or anything gets gets mixed up. <laughs> but so I'll start with some notes and then. Um, uh, we'll just begin a conversation with Terence and with um, with Jose and with Pablo. I think that would be really, really interesting for everybody. So um, Terence Gower has developed a series of projects that delve into modern architecture in Mexico and the United States, analyzing the strategies of display and representation that make buildings signify due to and beyond their function. In recent years, Gower has developed an ongoing series of case studies analyzing the history and intricacies of diverse di diplomatic and cultural buildings, through which architecture becomes a symbol of political and cultural interests, missions, and values. In the early decade of 2000, he developed two central projects based on Mexican modernism. The first led to his solo exhibition, Ciudad Moderna, at the Laboratorio Arte Alameda in Mexico City in 2005. The second was a curatorial and artistic project exploring the private and public dimensions of the confirmation of a private collection of Mexican modern art that became national patrimony accessible to the public. The result was an exhibition titled Prácticas Públicas, Vidas Privadas, presented at the Museo de Arte Carrillo Hill in 2006. The project was based on a research of the foundational collection of the museum it was based also on the figure of Dr. Alvar Carrillo Gil and his wife, Carmen, who built their private collection between the 1930s and the 1960s. But mainly, it delved into the private and public dimensions of the collectors, as well as the private and public agenda of the artists that conformed the collection, 
particularly the position of Mexican muralists who promoted a socially committed and anti-bourgeois art, yet produced a body of works that were purchased by private collectors. The Museo Carrillo Gil was designed by Mexican modernist architect Augusto H. Alvarez. During the late 1950s, here's one of the very early sketches of um, Alvarez's design. Um, so it was designed during the late 1950s and opened to the public in 1974. It was created to hold, research, and exhibit the collection built by Alvar and Carmen Carrillo Gil, which was led to the Mexican government through a donation sale agreement in the 70s. Carrillo Gil ventured into his contemporaries. He began his collection. If you can move to the following slide. which is, well, the building after the refurbishment in the 1980s, done by the son of Augusto H. Alvarez. And the next slide is a, is a current view of the museum. So this is how it looks today. And then the next slide, we can see Dr. Alvar Carrillo Hill with his collection at his home in the very private environment before it was uh, given to the to the Mexican government to conform this museum. Wonderful picture. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's really, uh, you know, the effective side of a, of a collector. Yep. So Carrillo Gil ventured into his contemporaries. He began his collection with works by Jose Clemente Orozco and David Alfaro Siqueiros before they were internationally legitimized or acquired by other Mexican collectors who began looking at the Escuela Mexicana de Pintura until the late 1940s. So it was in the 30s that he, he began um, not only purchasing, but also supporting and becoming really, really close friends with, with these artists. Um, Albert Carrillo Hill was known for his novel taste and defiant attitude towards established aesthetic values. He articulated his collection echoing the ideas of his time, which is also the, the inheritance that we have today at the museum since the late, since the 80s the museum has dedicated to, to promote the work of young artists. Um, so Gower's analysis of the Carrillo Hill collection, if you can, we can see the next slide, concentrated on four central artists, Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, Gunter Gerso, and Alvar Carrillo Hill himself, who developed an amateur artistic practice in his late years, inspired by the artists that he most admired. The works were exhibited in a series of domestic environments. Um, to the right, you can see uh, a simulation of a studio, of Alvar Carrillo Hill's studio, what was supposed to be his studio, or Terence's interpretation of that. And um, in general, the, the works were exhibited in a series of domestic environments, heavily charged by the paradox between the muralist's politically committed, committed practice and the production of visual paintings that, even if experimental and novel, conformed the private counterpoint of social art. The central argument of the exhibition was the contrast between, if we can see the next slide, a black and white reproduction of Siqueiro's mural, Retrato de la Burguesía, Portrait of the Bourgeoisie. This, was, this is a mural created in 1939 and it's located at the building of the Mexican Electrician Union. Um, so it was, a reproduction at the very uh, very back wall of the of the galleries, and then several sections uh, reproducing different domestic environments with works. Um, it was a selection of works of Cubist works by Rivera, uh, still lives by Siqueiros, abstract works by Gerso, together with a selection of films where he participated as art director and a group of works by Alvar Carrillo Gil, which we saw in the previous slides, evoking a hypothetical visit to his studio, revealing the condensation of his very personal view and fascination of the art of his time. I don't know, Terence, if you can have a couple of slides of, uh, uh -huh. of this exhibition, if, if you want to talk a little bit more about this. Sure. Um, I think mostly we have images of the, um, of the Siqueiros installation as which was as you just mentioned is one one quarter of the exhibition um, but if we look at the next image so this is so compare this image we're looking at now with the next image exactly and um so the first image of course had a kind of um uh 
you know, a caretaker's desk, you know, the, where the kind of policeman would sit, the person that's kind of looking after the galleries. And, and this, of course, you go around the corner and there's a domestic interior, kind of a bourgeois um, interior. It's like the sideboard, kind of like you'd be in somebody's dining room or something in a bourgeois house, a little, a little kind of mise-en-scene. Um, the idea is you go around the corner from that and there you have the, the, the reproduction of the portrait of the bourgeoisie. It's, it's reproduced one-to-one -one actually at the actual original scale. Um, so in each instance, each of the artists that I worked, you know, that I worked on, um, the idea was to create this kind of, this contrast working with these different kind of interior designs as well. Um, just to very, very quickly, the, the whole project really started because it was an invitation from the director of, in that period, Carlos Hashida, to just do a, you know, just do a reading of the collection, do the, on the second floor of the museum. And I didn't really know the, the easel paintings by these artists, by Rivera or, or Siqueiros at that time. Of course, I was very familiar with their, with their public works. And then it was going into the, into the, the collection, which was a super exciting moment for me. Um, I started to come across, you know, this, this, this series of easel paintings that, of course, is what Cuttery Hill was collecting. So that's, that was the original inspiration for the show, um, was to kind of figure it out for myself in a way. Anyway, if you keep, I don't think we have images of the other parts of the show, but this, I think that maybe then, is there another image of the? There's the another one, yeah. Okay. And so, for instance, the Brie Soleil you see on the right is actually is also part of my intervention in the space. So you see one on the left, so you're seeing at the far end of this photograph, you're seeing the, the Diego Rivera um, uh, section of the exhibition. So you have a series of, again, a kind of domestic interior with paneled wall with, with some, um, some portraits from the from the teens, I think that's that, that uh, Rivera did in Paris, and then adjacent to that are a series of of covers. Actually, they're they're woodcuts for communist journals that's, that um, Diego Rivera did that somebody lent to the exhibition as his kind of public his public work, what would be seen by a larger public rather than just the kind of private you know these private viewings in the interiors. And here you see have a better view of the um, of the Siqueiros painting. In fact, I showed only I just really showed a single. Um, easel painting of Siqueiros, which is the Tropicos, which is um, in the collection, actually appears in the show at the at the America Society as well, and talk about. Thanks, Terence. Well, um, so I think this this exhibition is one of these early case studies in a way. It's like the, the fusion sure. between the you know the modernist adventure you know that you you researched um, thoroughly during the. 2000, the decade of the 2000s, but this is a, a, an early institutional critique um, study of Much the fun. confirmation of a collection that's a private collection and ends up uh, becoming a public and not only a public uh, collection, but a national patrimony, um, you know, of the, 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 the different ways and paths that um, art can lead and, and the merging as well between the private and the public realm. Um, which is, um, it's really interesting how Carrillo Hill built his collection and then he was a knight and he was this very um, particular um, character during the, the construction of the Mexican um, recognition of Mexican art internationally. His collection actually formed part of every single national exhibition presented within Mexico and internationally. And it was many exhibitions that he organized himself or together with Fernando Gamboa, um, who was the director of the Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes at the time. And, um, but also, uh, you know, one of the exhibitions that uh, was conformed practically with, uh, with, with, uh, with his collection, or his Siqueiros collection, was the one that in the 1970s, well, in 1970 was presented at the, uh, well, then it was the Center for Inter-American Relations to the American Society. And this is the exhibition that you take as a starting point for your research for the current show at the American Society. Um, and I think it's, uh, yeah, well, this is, okay, these are the views of the original exhibition in 1970. And it's also a particular moment in the, uh, for the American Society, because it was, uh, it's just a couple of years after its foundation, right? And, uh, exactly. you know, this is an exhibition promoting inter-American relations. And uh, that was part of the whole uh, promotion of, or, or the foreign cultural uh, 
policy uh, in Mexico and within the relationship with the United States. And uh, so this, uh, in this exhibition, you are referring to, uh, to this previous Carrillo Hill collection exhibition at the American Society. It is in a way a homage to Siqueiros, which you are uh, a great admirer of his work, as we were talking about a couple of days ago. And, um, and this, this current exhibition connects, of course, with this previous research that, that you did um, about the Carrillo, the Carrillo Hill collection. And I think it's really interesting if we can see the next slide and the following, how you planned for the works to reemerge from the walls like ghosts or like chimeras from the beginning of this iconic institution. And now on top of that, you know, these are the ghosts of this moment. You are doing a research again about the foundation of this particular organization, the impact of the, uh, the policies, the cultural policies that this institution represents and still represents today, and how you're um, doing, uh, you know, it's, it's a connection between an early case study research and the series of case studies that you present in the exhibition. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about this, the show before, um, you know, we can move on sure. to, to further yeah. works. Um, it's no, it, I like the way you keep you talk about case studies as well because it's a it's a, a series that I've been working on for the last ten years of the series of case studies about U.S. embassy design around the world, and um, it's 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 a, as much about cultural diplomacy as as, it, as geopolitics, of course. And I think these things kind of come together in a place like America Society as well, of course. Um, so the to introduce the Siqueiros as a as a kind of um, the 1970 exhibition as a kind of um, foundation for my show um, was was very much about that. It's about kind of evoking you know institutional institutional memory, history, um, and actually kind of bringing that bringing that out to the present again. Um, I think that's. I think that's. I think you 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 got it. I think um, there was an there was a. Obviously, all sorts of nice parallels with the with the exhibition in two thousand six at the at the Caru Hill as well, that occurred with this exhibition, and it kind of um, the the idea of using Siqueiros as a way of kind of trying triangulating my practice with Mexico, with the institution of America Society was, was um was something that kind of was it was arrived at, very much you know during the during the planning of the exhibition it was. I may was there um, when we started to look at the archives and um, and think about, you know, think about a, a, a much more kind of site specific work that could work with the exhibition. And that's how this started to develop. It was actually. Um, um, yeah, I guess we, it, it, it was kind of in, thought of as a kind of institutional critique as well to, to introduce this to think about. Think about the space in ideological terms as well. Of course, 1, one of the thing we, things we haven't mentioned. So far is Siqueiros' political activity, which was, you know, which is the thing that, of course, landed him in prison. I think the, the count is six times um, under under various presidents. And um, and he was a kind of unreconstructed Marxist, you know, through his, through his, through his entire life until he died. And I think um, um, it, to see him exhibiting in a place that was pretty soon kind of the, the site of the brainstorm for for NAFTA was kind of an, you know, was a very interesting, there's an interesting contrast happening there as well. So I like the idea of kind of the spirit of Siqueiros coming back, however it was expressed at the time. Then then there's a whole, the whole issue of easel painting and that the, you know, the international viewers were actually seeing Siqueiros as easel painting as opposed to his his murals, um, which was another issue. So these were these were other kind of issues behind behind the installation as well. Turning in a way, turning these easel paintings into a giant mural as well is what happened. Okay, maybe maybe we should move, for, move forward to Jose's. We can continue. Yes, um, yeah. uh, I don't want to highlight how incredible um, the thought process of Terence was to arrive to this show and to arrive to this connection. Um, we spend, I think we comment this in a previous panel, but for anybody new that is watching this video, this exhibition came up after a long series of conversations with Terence in which 
we're trying to, to find the right way to, to discuss his work uh, in and about Mexico. And as you know, as an artist that is always working with case studies and that is trying to do institutional critique, it's very interesting that he was able to pinpoint this one event that connected his own research about the idea of the public and the private in Mexico, which is something that he feeds from cicadas, cicadas like books and ideas himself. And at the same time, connect that with his previous practice on cicadas works on the Gabish of Chile collection. So it all came together very beautifully and it shows very nicely in the show. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> no. Actually, because um, the, so, yes. the, the, process, the process of doing the show was, it was, it was exactly, it fell exactly during the quarantine. I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, and I think it was like, we were like locked down for about four months and we were, it was pretty much weekly. We had weekly conversations for an hour each time. It was amazing. So it was like the long, intense period of discussion, you know, to leading, leading up to the final um, checklist and decisions for the show. So it was, it was an incredible luxury, I'd say, to be able to do that. Um, Absolutely. to work on the show and that, with that kind of intensity. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And really the connection, the connection with previous, this previous research and then, you know, emerging from the walls in a, in a new ghostly manner, <laughs> you know, it's a, I think it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a long thread. Like and a memory, uh, like a thing you just can't, it never goes away. It's like, it's keep, you drag it around with you forever kind of thing. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's also beautiful because it's a memory of something that, I mean, at the same time, something that neither of us really lived, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's also about how we live certain history through the archives, um, yeah. through the revisitation of certain figures. So that was very beautiful. But anyway, let's go to Jose. Sorry. I want to make sure that we discuss more works, more works. Can you hear me? Yeah, your mute was on, I think. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for the invitation. Terence, congratulations on the beautiful exhibition. Um, congratulations to the American Society team as well. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with um, friends and colleagues. Um, I was wondering, I had done an update just recently, a second ago, to the presentation, to the drive. I'm not sure if it's reflected in the one that's showing now. Um, I'm sorry to get, yeah, exactly. If we can start there for a second. Um, can you go to the next one to see if it updated? Okay, no, it doesn't seem like it updated, but it's totally fine. We can stay in the cover of the castle. Um, so I was asked to talk about um, this work specifically, um, and I'll maybe say some things about um, another project that Terence has worked on and is part of the exhibition. Um, and these are two specifically uh, projects that I've been quite interested in and have actually uh, had the, I guess, privilege of being able to present within an exhibition. I organized the Humix Museum a few years ago that focused on a journalist called Esther McCoy, which is also the focus of um, this piece by Terence called The Castle. Interestingly, this um, piece um, from 2007 and the other one I'll talk about briefly after called Ciudad Moderna from 2004 are both works that emerged from uh, visits to archives. Um, and it'd be wonderful to be able to get some of the insight from that experience. Also, Terence, um, as I'm sure it was quite unique, the Casco was um, um, basically a piece that emerged from a series of vis visits to the Smithsonian archives, to the papers of Esther McCoy, this um, LA-based journalist um, from the 1960s, well, 50s and 60s. Um, and um, Ciudad Moderna, if I'm not mistaken, was um, at the Filmoteca Arunam um, that focused, exactly. in, right? Yes. Um, so, so Castle actually um, looks into um, the relationship between the American journalist Esther McCoy and the Mexican architect Francisco Artigas. Um, and it uses the play format, if we can move to, this, to the next slide, um, it uses the play format in a satirical way um, to somewhat kind of enact uh, the first encounter of Esther McCoy 
um, with um, the 1970 house known as the castle by Francisco Artigas, uh, which ended up being his, his home. And we can move to the next slide also. Um, and maybe we can, <laughs> stay, we can stay in this image for a second. Um, I'm not sure if many of the people who are tuned in are familiar with Artigas' work, but Artigas is really um, perhaps known as one of the premier representatives of what was understood as Mexican modernism throughout the 50s and 60s. Um, and interestingly, by 1970, he designs and builds this house for a, this Renaissance-style Renaissance castle as his private home. Um, and it's interesting, it, it'd, be, it'd be great to hear a little bit of what your what that kind of like fictional dialogue um, with uh, with that uh, first encounter was about Terence. Sure. Um, and then I, uh, I I'd also, um, but before that, um, I wrote something about Esther McCoy because I think that that, that, that fascination of yours with these characters, um, I, I see some of like Esther McCoy in your, in, in, in your practice in a way. That's correct. Uh, and is this, this sort of like, this, she was an American journalist who was visiting Mexico City a lot of the time, but mainly she was known for her time in uh, the work she was doing in Los Angeles as an editor of Arts and Architecture magazine. And I'll read a little bit about Esther McCoy, and it'd be um, interesting um, to for the audience to think about this in relationship to Terence's practice, but also in relationship to to the, the this this artwork and this house specifically. Um, so I, it opens with a quote. Um, it was she, almost single-handedly, who awakened serious scholars to the extraordinary richness of California architecture, wrote the New York Times architecture critic Paul Goldberger about Esther McCoy in, 19, in the 1975 edition of her influential book, Five California Architects, which was first published in 1960. This same line was again reprinted in her New York Times obituary in 1989. Also quoted was Cesar Pelli, former dean of the Yale School of Architecture. He said, our knowledge of Southern California architecture has been primarily formed by her research, her first-handed knowledge and her writing, which is so precise and passionate, end quote. This line had been printed in the same paper five years earlier in the context of a feature on McCoy titled Chronicler of California Architecture. In this piece, the author introduces McCoy as a, quote, personality, and implies that due to her looks and demeanor, she had recently been mistaken by another more mediatized characters, such as the controversial Hollywood screenwriter, Lily Hellman, and the eccentric artist, jo George O'Keefe. McCoy, a powerhouse in her own right, was a leading critical voice in the male-dominated architecture community for over half a century, but her legacy is often obscured by the stardom of those she wrote about. As a personality who was always behind the pen, it is not surprising that audiences need to constantly be reminded about the importance and impact of her work uh, that her work had in the nascent identity of California modernism, a now well-constructed and globally identifiable, uh, identifiable aesthetic. While the mid-century look and lifestyle of the sun-filled western coast of the United States is so easily recognizable nowadays, one of the most influential characters that contributed to, the, to its construction is rarely acknowledged. So, uh, so yet again, we find ourselves reflecting on the legacy of Esther McC McCoy's work, but this time with, with the aim of, of expanding her reach from the hills and valleys of Los Angeles, her chosen home since 1932, to the vibrant and contextual modernist scene that was developing in Mexico City during the 1950s, where she traveled periodically after an extended stay of nine months in Cuernavaca during 1951. In Mexico City, she was um, she not only saw a rapidly growing metropolis, but also a new design language that was unlike any uh, that was unlike anything she had been exposed to in California. It was uh, it was one that expertly merged traditional and craft uh, tradition and crafts with modernist principles, both for formal and ideological. It is difficult to determine exactly how her published writing, research, and photographs impacted the development of either architectural scenes, both Los Angeles and Mexico City. Uh, but it is clear that there is a connection in the design language and spatial articulation that architects from both places used. And she was an obvious bridge that brought these two very distinct cultures and geographies closer. 
During her many trips to Mexico, McCoy wrote several articles on the rapid development she witnessed for an audience that knew little about the country. From an article about the construction of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México's new campus known as Ciudad Universitaria, to the domestic architecture of Barragán's Casa Prieto in the vast lava fields of Pedregal, both published in 1952. But perhaps most meaningful during her visits were, her lo were the long-term relationships with the key figures of, the moderniz uh, of this modernization period, such as Juan O'Gorman, Luis Barragán, and Francisco Artigas, whose architecture she wrote about. Less known, but perhaps more relevant in her development as a thinker, were friendships with, female, with leading female creatives such as designer Clara Porcet, with whom she attempt, attempted to start a joint business by mass producing and commercializing her legendary butaque chairs. The painter Helen O'Gorman, eh, from which she learned about the local flora of Mexico City, or the photographer Lola Alvarez Bravo, um, whose particular lens highlighted the country's um, cultural heritage. Even though McCoy wrote avidly and consistently about the creative landscape of Mexico for international publications such as the New York Times or Arts and Architecture magazines, the aesthetic, of the aesthetic, although widely recognized, never became as globally marketable as the California house lifestyle. While the Eames plastic chair appeared in homes all around the world soon after it was launched in 1950, the conditions of production and distribution in Mexico made unique pieces such as Porcet's butaca chairs, difficult to market. The combination of cheap, labor skill, of cheap skilled labor and readily accessible natural materials, alongside the cultural heritage and crafts in Mexico, eh, made this work unique to its context. Through her work, McCoy aimed at preserving the memory of designs such as the butaca chair, whose authorship is hardly ever attributed to Porcet, and Barragan's urban development of El Pedregal, uh, which um, were few other uh, original modern masterpieces, masterpiece houses remain in the international discourse. Um, by offering them a new uh, American architectural history, by offering them a place in the new American architectural history she was creating. And there's this really beautiful piece um, that Esther McCoy wrote in 1948 for The New Yorker before she was actually um, an architectural critic. Um, she wrote this this short piece, short fiction piece called The Important House in 1940. Um, it's a really wonderful piece um, that I, 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 I think is really connected to your experience or, or your interest in, in, in presenting her first encounter with this Renaissance style house. Um, if, we, if we can go to the previous slide. Um, stay on the previous slide. Yeah, that one. Um, no, sorry, um, that, that, that one. The castle. Yeah. The castle. Um, so in that article, um, McCoy writes this, um, this really fun kind of like dialogue. It's basically a, a young couple that's living in this modernist house in California. And the architect, um, the architect is there to do a photo, to stage a photo shoot of the house um, and basically rearranges everything that the couple has in their house, removing <laughs> most of the things that make it a house basically um so I'll, I'll just read briefly this brief dialogue that the coy writes um, um you've made it look as if no one lived here miss blakely said and cracked sharply trying to keep calm the architect mr adrian responds i want to convey the total idea of the house um and miss blakely responds but you wouldn't convey a clear idea of the house if it, if it were left the way it, the way we live in it um, and I think that that's something uh, that McCoy was always um, really interested in um, modern architecture. It was being able to portray it through um, through the lived experiences of the people that inhabited them. Um, it was she, she she never only wrote about clear lines, and she was this really curious writer and um, and thinker. Um, and I think that the experience or the, the fictional encounter that, that Terence creates for her as she uh, arrives into this um, really clearly not modernist house that Artiga designed for himself in 1970 at the, um, is, a, is, is a, a, a really, is quite interesting to think about in, in, in relationship to, to, to the more dominant idea of modernism that has been published in magazines, like the clean lines and 
um, and the empty spaces. Um, and I'll just conclude in this project um, a, by reading this other little piece um, about McCoy and her connection to houses. Um, so for McCoy, a house is important not only because of its style or the origin of its designer and builder, but because of what comes, but, but because of what it comes to represent. In 1953, after McCoy had spent much time in Mexico, she wrote a piece for the Los Angeles Times Home Magazine, where she says, the charge that the California house is imported is not wholly native. Uh, and, and not wholly native is quite true. Many of the influences did come from Europe or Mexico or Japan, but the Gregorian house we consider American is certainly an import. She, conti she continued by saying, um, these styles, which were the, which, which the early Californians borrowed from Europe, were not at home under the, uh, sorry, uh, were not at home under the California skies. The houses represented different social ideals, climates, materials, and methods of construction. Fitting a style to a place did not prove successful. A place must evolve its own style if it is to endure. And this is both true of the architecture that was developed in both Los Angeles and Mexico City, which had to create its own language. When addressing the birthplace of a designer, McCoy wrote, the place is not as important as the imagination uh, as the imagination of the designer be free of the past, that his architectural allegiance be not to Europe or the East Coast, but only to the place, uh, to the place row which he is destined to build. Um, and I think that that's a, that, 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 that kind of like those last lines about kind of place and context is actually quite interesting um, in relationship to Artigas's desire to build this quite eccentric yeah. house. Um, and maybe we can hear a little bit about um, that, that dialogue that you've um, created for this piece, um, Terence. Yeah, um, very quick. Yeah, Jose, that was wonderful. The, I think you're gonna talk about Ciudad Morena as well quickly, but the, I think the, you're bringing up of the, um, it's something I hadn't, I hadn't made that connection before, but but um, McCoy writing for art and architecture in, in Los Angeles and being so instrumental in the case study house program in California. One of the main, um, you know, reasons for the case study house program was was building technology was was new materials. It's like let's try let's let's get architects use plastic. Let's get architects use these different new materials that are coming out in, mm -hmm. in the building trades. And um, and and in many ways they you know in a lot of these houses are expressions of that kind of that kind of technology, it's interesting. The forms, of course, evolved in all sorts of different ways. Some of them maybe were maybe coming from Mexico as well. Mm -hmm. And um, what's, what I love is the irony of, of McCoy going to Mexico um, and visiting Artigas. What happened, you know, was she, she visited him. This is, now we're talking 18 years after her first visits to Mexico. Mm -hmm. She's been maintaining this long dialogue with these architects. She's seen a lot of the work of Artigas, of course, who's, he was like one of the masters of, especially of the modern house in Mexico. He did the most, you know, probably iconic um, modern houses in the Petrial development. And um, and she goes to visit him. Of course, he says, "Well, I just built my own house for myself now." And um, and she goes to visit. And this is what the, how the piece evolved. Um, it's when I I encountered that I encountered the whole interview actually on tape. There are enormous number of tapes in the archives, and I started listening to them and. And I found out that she was actually going down and speaking, you know, interviewing different architects. And then I realized that she would take a tape recorder when she would visit, um, visit a building for the first time. And that was an interesting, I, I imagine, I don't know how many architectural journalists actually do that, actually tape their responses live to the, you know, as they go in and describe what they're seeing. Um, I guess now people do it with video a lot as well. But rather than writing it down afterwards, she would actually go in and actually do a kind of live recording of her first encounter with the building. And that was what, what was so interesting with the, when I discovered the tape of her visiting the castle for the first time. What I love is the irony of what she's actually seeing in the castle is Mexican building technology. You know, in some ways the high tech stuff from, um, that was experimented with in California at that point had not arrived in Mexico. Um, some in some some ways yes but you know mostly it was like just very good concrete construction mexico had incredible you know incredible builders and different and different materials but you could also 
partly because of the, the cost of labor in Mexico, you could still build in stone. It might even be cheaper building stone. Mm. And with, you know, with, with, you know, handmade tiled roofs and, and, and wood, you know, hand cut beams and all this kind of thing. Um, because of the, uh, because the labor situation in Mexico and the, you know, resources, um, this actually would have been kind of an acceptable building technology in Mexico in that period with the, you know, the, the, the building of the castle itself. So I love that that, that kind of that mm -hmm. kind of happens between this idea of you know, building technology between California and Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a great um, there's an there's a great statement about the 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 polytechnic in Mexico City. I've done of which I did a big project on. I've done a couple of works on that that opened in 1964 though at the Zacatenco campus. Um, the and it was very much it was Perez Rayon was the architect and. It's, it's, it was rumored to be very much inspired by IIT in Chicago, the Smith van der Rohe campus in Chicago, um, outside Chicago. And he, um, but, if, but the, you know, this, this sort of high technology building technology hadn't arrived yet in Mexico. So these extruded I-beams and this kind of thing, which was, you know, the Mies building was as much an expression of that as anything. Um, and so the rumor is that the, that a lot of these I-beams are actually handmade and kind of hammered into place to, to actually look like, like, um, like technological modernism, but actually it was artisanal modernism. It was actually handmade. I don't know how much, how true that is, but mm -hmm. I've heard that said a couple of times. Pablo would know actually. So, <laughs> anyway, thanks. Thanks. Let's hear what you have to say about Ciudad Morera now. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's not as um, well put together, but I also wanted to briefly talk about this work. Um, mm -hmm. More specifically, because if we can go to the next slide, um, this piece was actually um, shown at Storefront for Art and Architecture, which is where I currently work as director. Um, and this video um, a, from 2004, um, the exhibition, I believe, was in 2006, Terence, and you worked closely with um, Sarah Herda for that. Um, exactly. Just briefly, um, when Sarah Herda was the director, I was just reading this this really wonderful interview that, that the two of you did for the for the oh, newsprint for the newsprints. Although mo mostly you mostly talk about storefront, you, it's mostly you asking questions, which I'm, does not surprise me. <laughs> well, that was that was agreement. We're going to interview each other, and that was going to be the kind of the text for the show. It's going to be me asking her about storefront and her asking me about the work. It was very funny. Um, was, this is the first showing of that piece after the, the its debut in Mexico. In because it was commissioned for the Laboratorio Alte la Exactly. For that exhibition as well, no, Terence? Exactly. It was mm -hmm. a central a central work of a big exhibition of 10 installations called Ciudad Moderna. Of course, the book as well, Ciudad Moderna. And, um, uh, and that was the main work. So just for the listeners, um, so that they get a bit of a sense of what this video is, it's a it's a six minute video, six six mm -hmm. and a half minute video. So if you can go to the next slide, I think there's some. Oh, so that's the presentation at the storefront. Um, if you can go to the next slide, um, so right, so it is. Um, it's quite interesting because you basically um, it's it's a short video um, that takes. Um, if I'm not mistaken, all the footage comes from the same film, correct? Yes, exactly. Um, okay, which is Despedida de Casada from 1966, uh, directed by Juan de Orduña, um, mm -hmm. starring, I believe, Mauricio Garcés. <laughs> and Julissa. Uh, yeah. and, exactly. And like some this like incredible, incredible soundtrack as well. Uh, yep. But the film, interestingly, sort of like depicts... I mean, beyond the narrative that I believe it's kind of like a like a romantic comedy with um, about like a divorce, right? Um, exactly. Um, beyond the narrative, the film really depicts um, this idea from uh, early on in 1966. This idea of like the modern city um, mm -hmm. through through these like really um, sort of like handsome buildings that 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 um, really sort of convey this idea of, 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 a, of a modern lifestyle um, in, a, in a big city. Um, and you sort of edit it down to depict these buildings, but you also intervene it with these snippets of these architectural renderings um, that abstract these buildings to a basically a drawing. Um, exactly. The drawing somehow sort of slowly animates into 
um, a full life moving image with sound and color. Um, and this happens in a series of times over the course of the six and a half minutes. Um, I love it that actually the film starts um, with this uh, with this phrase that says I, I, it, that says like pronto vamos a grabar soon we'll start <laughs> shooting listos los micrófonos microphones ready atención vamos a empezar attention we're going to start atención las cámaras attention cameras and then the film starts the, the drawing sort of like um, and it animates into this like full full on motion picture. Um, and it's really this idea of like, the, like I, or the way I read it is that it's somehow you're reversing the modern city into a set um, and that you're constantly kind of like reminding us of the stage qualities of um, this modernist architecture um, that we've sort of like, that by the time you make this film is somehow, uh, it's, it's already kind of like that dissolution of like uh, the modern city. Um, and I really like this concept of, 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 of rendering. So you're kind of like rendering um, the, 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 this, this idea of modern architecture. Um, mm -hmm. But also um, in, this, in this interview that you do with Sarah Herda, um, there's this, um, you're talking about um, sort of how you got into, how you both got into what you do. Um, you were talking about your experience of working at a bookshop in London, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, yeah. And that you were de debating between going to architecture school or going to art school. Mm -hmm. um, but then, and this is a quote from you, that you realized you were more interested in the representation of architecture than in the buildings themselves. Um, and I think that this film somehow really captures that interest of being, of being more, I guess, like excited about the representation of architecture, um, and 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 somehow your work feature displays that that it's like the representation of architecture through a narrative film and a documentary, through a theater play, through a fictional theater play, through a photo mural, through a model. Really, all of your practice somehow or the way I see it, um, is uh, a representation of architecture. Mm -hmm. And it's both very serious, but also somewhat satirical in a way. It's a, and, and, and yeah, I think, I think, I think that it, it somehow is this constant sort of like back and forth between a, the real object that you're studying or the representation of it. Mm -hmm. And it'd be great to hear your thoughts on on that film because it, that film really sort of like circulated. Sure. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you got a lot of exposure. So, so first of all, the um, one of the we talked a bit of. So I did this. Did come out of a, a kind of relationship with a, not a long relationship, but but an intensive relationship with the Filmoteca, with the Film Archive at the University in Mexico City. When I started, when we planned the show at the Arte Alameda in Mexico City. Um, they immediately made the connection to the film archive so we could, I could start kind of viewing films. What I was interested in, I'd been seeing these films kind of on television and things at late night, um, was this, was the, the initial point, was this kind of meeting point, uh, the, the kind of like the low point of Mexican cinema with the high point of Mexican architecture. So we, you know, we had the golden age where uh, the films were these great masterpieces and works of art that kind of slid into the 1950s and 60s, which were these kind of, these kind of sex comedies and almost Bollywood style things with lots of dancing and singing and violence. And, and, um, and I was, and at the same time, the city was kind of emerging as this, as this absolutely incredible um, masterpiece itself. And that kind of, you know, it appeared in these films. This film actually is shot in Mexico city and Acapulco and Acapulco was in, you know, it was like the most beautiful place on earth. It was a, a two or three beautiful modern hotels and then just, just nature. Um, with, as far as the, you know, the structure of the piece itself, I was exa ex interested in exactly what you're describing. So I was, um, one of the things, and actually it's, it relates very nicely to that Esther McCoy, New Yorker piece, um, was, is how is, how is architecture, how are we accustomed to architecture being depicted? And of course the modern, um, architectural photograph generally has, is devoid of people. It's what it's the it's what the architect wants to see, which is kind of the form of the building, and and to be, be able to see it from all the angles and see how the sun hits it, all these different things. 
Um, there, there are different schools of, of, of photography, of course, but I was interested in taking this like, extremely lively, entertaining film and, and turning it into an architectural slideshow. So what, you, what I've basically done is I've taken frames from the film and I've, we Photoshopped those frames, basically, and cleaned them up and taken the people out and turned them into image architecture. And that's what you see in the, um, in the prints that you see in that, in that storefront for art and architecture installation on the, on the red wall is, is a series of prints that are actually printed series from the, um, of those stills from the, from the film. Um, I also, I was interested in, you know, stopping, translating the, these, these images into, 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 into a variety of different kind of architectural media in a way. So that's, that's why the drawings appear as well, both black and white and color drawings. And then they kind of morph into, into the action. So there's a, there's a bit of a confusion for the viewer, like what came first was the, you know, did somebody film, draw this location and then build it and then film it? Like how did this, um, what's the sequence of events that occurred here? And there's a nice kind of uncanny effect from that, definitely. The, you, the sense of humor, of course, is, is obvious. I think you, you caught that as well. And I think it's, you know, it's clear in both, in both of the projects you're talking about as well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely in a, you know, a, a very strong interest in representation. The mm -hmm. other the, a parallel kind of parallel piece to that is this video Polytechnic, mm -hmm. um, which is often shown, you know, it's often shown together with, with Ciudad Moderna. In that piece, I've actually taken a series of still images and animated them. Um, so, and turn it into kind of a motion film there, you know, it's using the, again, the conventions of architectural documentary mm -hmm. from that period from the sixties, mostly, um, you know, where it's like zooms and pans and moving across the image and this kind of, how do, how do we kind of, how can we make this still imagery more dynamic mm -hmm. in Ciudad Moderna? I'm, of course, I'm doing the opposite. How can you take the dynamism out of the, um, how, out of the imagery and just create these kind of still architectural photographs mm -hmm. because they're there, you know, they're always there. The document of the city is always always there in the background. Super. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, Terence. And we can go to Pablo now. Yeah, maybe so I can much, everybody. Say something or I can jump right in because there's a lot of a lot of connections that we can yeah, make. Incredible. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. Um, just um, Terence, in, in, in answer to your provocation as to whether the Politecnico uh, beams were actually handmade. Uh, I think, I think um, I will not confirm it or deny it. Uh, I think, I think we can live with that, with that possibility. They uh, may or may not have been handmade. Okay. It, good. They may or may not have been handmade. But one, one thing, one thing that did happen uh, that I can, that I can confirm is that for the construction of, uh, of Ciudad Universitaria uh, of UNAM uh, 10 years earlier uh, and the Polytechnic, many new uh, industries were activated. So, so these materials were not available, were not commercially available. Certain types of brick, certain types of window frames, uh, certain types of, uh, of steel uh, components were not available. And part of, part of the magnitude of this works that I think your work is, is uh, constantly reminding us of, of, of how big these things were and how, how ambitious uh, Mexican modernity was uh, part of part of what these large works did was to generate a market for that kind of for, for those kind of components. That then they like for example the, the types of bricks that are used in in at UNAM um, uh, then become standard for for public schools all over the country. Yeah. So so public schools all over Mexico became uh, like uh, scale uh, models of of this grand uh, institutional uh, urban configuration. So, so I think I think um, I think we can live in that space of of this uh, works activating new dynamics and uh, um, and also masking their absence. Uh, yeah. Quick question: were, were some of these great works like Ciudad, um, like the Ciudad Universitaria, were they conceived partially as as kind of um, to stimulate the building trades? Um, like you see in other parts of the world. I mean, this is with the case in Sweden, and that's you know the, the public housing I was studying there. It was very much about that. A lot, a lot of that is talked about uh, uh, earlier, like in the in the late '40s. Uh, mm -hmm. then, okay. But the, the works become so large that there's not enough uh, uh, building capacity. There's not enough people to actually build them, and enough construction companies. Not, not enough concrete. Not <laughs> enough concrete available in the country. Exactly. That, that, like we'll, we'll talk about uh, Tlatelolco 
in more detail in a moment, but Tlatelolco, at the time it was dedicated in 1964, was the, the largest uh, housing complex in Mexico with uh, 12,000 units, more or less. And uh, uh, if you follow the, the archive, um, the, the, the news are you know, partly about the, the greatness of the Mexican government that is building housing for, for everybody and, and modernizing and transforming the country. Uh, but but the, the, the details um, are, are more uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, for example, on, on, on May 3rd is the, the, the day in which uh, the Dia de la Santa Cruz of the Holy Cross and is the, the day of, of construction workers. And traditionally, uh -huh. in construction sites in Mexico, they have uh, barbacoa, they have lamb, lamb tacos, slow, slow cooked uh, lamb tacos. And um, all the, all the, 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 the lamb, all the, the, how do you call those animals? The lamb is when, when you cook it. All the, um, the sheep? The sheep. <laughs> Young sheep. <laughs> am I, why am I losing, losing basic words? The yeah. sheep in all of the Valley of Mexico and surrounding uh, states were, were all eaten up. And they had to bring sheep from other places because there were so many workers that were actually building these complexes that there was not enough land for all of them. So, so this is this is kind of the, the, the magnitude, the scale of, of what's going on. And I think I think that's part of what you know. We, we, uh, uh, Jose was talking a lot about representation, and and we can we can uh, continue talking about that. But I also want to talk about this. Um, uh, there's something. Uh, that representations do and uh, some some emotions they, they generate uh, um, and my sense when when the when the, the show uh, Ciudad Moderna was shown in, in Laboratorio de Arte Alameda was that it, it was one of the first instances I saw in which in which Mexicans in particular people from Mexico City were allowed to be excited about the the, the, the country's modernist past uh -huh. uh, because you know, the, the, we, we have this, this huge uh, building operations uh, starting in the 40s with national construction programs for schools, hospitals, housing, markets, and so on. Um, and at that time, there's, there's great uh, optimism and, and, and everybody's very excited about this. But then we have, um, you mentioned it at the outset, uh, we have uh, 1968, the student massacre in one of, in one of the, in, in Tlatelolco, in this, in this housing project. And, and then we have, uh, 1985, the, the earthquake in which many of these buildings actually fall, and 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 and, and all of this comes together with with uh, a lot of um, you know a growing opposition to uh, to the to the Mexican government, and so and so these buildings come to represent uh, their authoritarianism and, and and their failings at trying to modernize uh, uh, fully modernize the country. So I think I think there was a lot of uh, resistance. At, at, at um, you know embracing, celebrating, feeling excited about these buildings, and then I, I remember when I when I first uh, met you and I read all the reviews I could find of that show, uh, and I was uh, taken aback by by how excited all the reviewers were at discovering huh. a way in which they could express their their fondness or or their excitement for this period uh, uh, in, in in a way that 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 let them bypass. All these other uh, associations we have with these buildings. So, so I think um, the works are very much about representation, and the works themselves were representations. But there's also um, a profound uh, transformations and, and real emotions behind, behind, or not behind, that come together with, or that emerge together with uh, this uh, representations. Um, um, one of the things that that um, that I keep coming back in, in my own research and, and that your work uh, reminds me of is the fact that, that, that these housing projects um, uh, and, and this uh, infrastructural configurations by the, by the, by the Mexican state were um, uh, in fact um, the origin of what we would recognize today as, as Mexico's middle class. Um, and, and of course there was, there was a very aggressive government program if you read the, the the comments government officials were making in the in the fifties about, for example, housing projects, they will say, and we've confirmed that uh, that, that these projects are being effective because uh, Mexicans are in fact showering much more often, and we can we can uh, uh, show this because we have uh, um, a, a much larger uh, consumption of hot water 
in, in, in Mexico City's housing, right? So Hyg hygiene, hygiene, exactly. But, but so, 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 so these things are, are very aggressive interventions into people's lives. And there's like a, a lot of uh, social engineering that, that, that comes together with it. Um, but people who are, who, are, who are living in these places are, are not simply uh, the subjects of, of state intervention, but they're also the, 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 the willing participants in their own transformation and their own uh, um, becoming as a, as, a, as, a, as a modern middle class in the country. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, you know, uh, I, I work as an anthropologist in many of these complexes, and I read uh, often what, what um, you know, Americans, uh, or, uh, American academics will write about uh, modern housing uh, or Europeans, uh, and they, they are very much in, in, in this uh, Foucauldian uh, mindset saying that, that, that these things are, are shaping populations and that are, that are very aggressive and that are controlling who, who they are, they're sub giving shape to their subjectivities, but they very rarely ask uh, the people who actually live in these places who turn out to be very much aware of this and often have very willingly participated in that process, right? They were, they were yeah. also agents in their uh, in, in, in their, their, they're being shaped into into this population, right? They were not simply uh, um, um, victims or subjects, but actually actually agents in this process. Yeah, they weren't forced into these, you know, especially in Mexico. And you know, at gunpoint, there were there was an aspirational thing as well going on, and it was this it was this desire to leave. And I, I you know I wrote about this in, this in that article for Domus to leave the chaos of the city and enter this kind of new ordered hygienic place, this realm where everything's ordered and you know things are everyone has windows and things are stacked properly and um, the chaos versus order very much that was and that was the draw that was the, the goal um, and um, the um, of course there, there's there's a, a lot of processes that, that come after moving in that we could talk about that involve how these places are shaped, how they're resignified, how they're how they're informed over time. Uh, but I, I, I want to talk uh, about this uh, particular work that we're seeing here. That... Actually, can I can I make a little parenthesis? Yeah. And also how chaos is introduced into the order of the of the complex as soon as people arrive, <laughs> and that's well, what that was particularly fascinating for me. Well, not 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 yeah, not only how chaos is introduced, but more how chaos is always there. You know, it's, it's exactly the only place where chaos is not is in architectural renderings and maybe in, archi in, in, in photographs, archi architectural photographs. Um, yeah. You know, the, 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 the photos uh, Jose was showing uh, um, that are that are very much, you know, playing with this with this idea of the of the state set, but that all are, are also, um, 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 you know, part of part of what the what what the architects intended the works to be. Right, and 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 once once a building is in the process of being built or has been inhabited, uh, that that intention is, is is you know necessarily thrown to the side uh, um, because um, it's a, it's it's an illusion. It's a rendering that that that, that cannot be implemented uh, because it's, it's utopian. It's utopian. Almost. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, once once in a, in in one of these projects, um, uh, I was talking to to one of the residents and uh and i was with a friend who who told him you must be very proud because you live in a mario pani house and the and the resident was profoundly offended he said i do not live in a mario pani house the house is my own uh yeah. and so i think that is that is you know very very telling of, of what kind of problems <laughs> occur in this in this uh in this utopias um but well the the this this uh this work we're seeing here um, was um, part of, a, of an exhibition I did in 2014, I think, in, in uh, the Contemporary Art Museum in, in Monterrey, and was there then shown in 2016 in Museo Amparo in Puebla. And, uh, and so, you know, Terence was, was working on this, on, on, on this piece, and I uh, thought it was very, very fitting because it has a lot of the humor you were discussing earlier. Uh -huh. uh, irony and a lot of the tensions that I have been alluding to. Um, it's actually uh, um, a composition made uh, with uh, axonometrical drawings of housing blocks from 
multifamiliar Miguel Alemán, multifamiliar Juárez, Unidad Santa Fe, and Tlatelolco. So uh, four of the more uh, the most emblematic uh, housing projects by Pani come together here in this uh, in, in this composition, which which uh, has um, uh, this very exciting element of, of allowing us to imagine what would have happened if uh, Pani's dreams of actually you know building not only Tlatelolco but but a hundred uh, more more Tlatelolcos and reshaped uh, the country uh, uh, after his after his uh, idea of what a city should be like. Uh, so so it's it's in, in a way it's very exciting to be able to 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 see that dream uh, realized here. And at the same time, it's of course profoundly scary, right? Because uh, we know that that for the construction at least of Tlatelolco, uh, dozens of, of city blocks were were demolished. Lots of uh, uh, tenements. Uh, uh, with working class families were raised to the ground. Many of them were, were colonial in origin. People were displaced. Uh, and, and so, so for this uh, ideal city to, to take hold, uh, um, a lot of destruction uh, had to happen. And so here, here um, the destruction in this, in this wall is immense, as you can see, because it takes on uh, uh, this uh, huge uh, space on the, on the wall. And also the the other the other tension and the other irony here that I that I find fascinating is that um, Pani is is uh, constantly described as a as a functionalist, which he was not. Uh, but uh, but but Terence is is constantly playing with this with this uh, with this idea that he was or that he might have been. Um, so so he takes he takes all the all the. Um, the buildings designed by Pani that are supposedly functionalist and turns them into a pattern that is a decorative pattern to to, to decorate a space, right? So I think I think uh, uh, there's there's the the irony that that is also very much present in the in the Tlatelolco project in which what is emphasized is that the composition of the facades and uh, uh, Pani is is, um, is clearly uh, thinking very much as a as a Beaux Art architect. Uh, uh, more so than 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 what you know a, a functionalist rationalist architect of the time uh, would have been doing. So so um, anyway, we can we can talk more about that tension. And just just as a final uh, comment on this on this uh, uh, wallpaper, uh, the the we decided to present it at the opening at the outset, the first call of the exhibition, and to put it right next to. An oil painting of Mario Pani, uh, not by Siqueiros but by Orozco, uh, who was who was his uh, his close friend uh, for the little uh, while that they that they collaborated between forty four and forty six when when Orozco died, and and this was uh, perhaps the last uh, portrait that that Orozco made, uh, and and of course it it, it graced uh, uh, Mario Pani's living room in his Augusto Alvarez designed apartment. Uh, and then it raised the uh, today it raises the, the the living room of one of his uh, sons, um, and so he he was very kind to to let us put it here to introduce all these relations uh, and, and connections that of course your work is also about and the, and the exhibition uh, that we're discussing is also about. Can we can we, okay so okay I forgot we also. Uh, included uh, the same pattern as the end papers of the of the okay. catalog that you can see there. And you can also yep. see here. Yes, exactly. And uh, and then for the cover of the of the catalog, uh, inspired by by Terence, we took uh, a section of one of uh, Pani's housing projects and made it into a decorative pattern for the for the book's cover. So 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 the the Terence work is very much. Um, uh, infused in this uh, exhibition, and then the next the next uh, photos show uh, the the Tlatelolco project, uh, which is um, uh, which is both uh, a set of uh, cardboard models uh, of of the buildings in Tlatelolco that show the the very um, uh, sleek designs of the of the facades, and I, I, again this uh, this idea that that this could have gone on forever. And covered the entire world, um, and this this um, this uh, image in particular is reminiscent of some of the some of the photos 
uh, of uh, lower shot in the mid 60s of Tatelolco, and which this is again something that may or may not have happened, but Pani claimed that he sent them uh, to La uh, Architectura de to be published, and they responded with a letter saying that they did not uh, publish models, only built projects. And so, uh, I love that. And so the, 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 the project was so uh, unbelievable and the scale was so immense and the buildings were, were so sleek in their, in their appearance uh, that the French editors of the magazine uh, thought that, that it was a, a project and not actually a built work, uh, which goes back to, to the idea of, of scale uh, of, of what happened in Mexico at that time which was huge and unprecedented. Do we have another image of the um, of the actual models of the Tlatelolco? Is there is there another image coming up? Or? It's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there it is. There we go. There they are. And of course, I may suggest. No, go ahead. Please go, Paolo. Paolo. No, 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 I'm going to say that, that most of these buildings have uh, been transformed uh, radically after '85. They they reinforced the structures by building some sort of like. Uh, box outside you know outside of them so they they would hold in a in a in another earthquake and so far they have uh, but of course the, the this idea of uh, of of the bright uh, modern uh, future that they that they uh, conjured uh, has uh, has disappeared no i think that the facades are pa paintings you know they're beautiful op-ed masterpieces or op art rather masterpieces they're um... And the the piece is one of the entry points for the work is of course exactly that that it's the the poetry of Pan, you know, to to conceive of these facades which were so beautiful I think, and now we're completely covered up with buttressing. Mm -hmm. um, these are these are the four main building types of the of the complex. This is this is the complex I was mentioning in the beginning. That that local. Twelve thousand units, and I think it's one hundred and three buildings originally because like uh -huh. five of them have been demolished or uh, collapse in the earthquake. But you can imagine the scale of this place, which has is within within a municipality of Mexico City, but has its own uh, internal uh, government uh, because of the, of the scale and also because of the very sharp uh, limits uh, to its surroundings, which is mostly working class neighborhoods. And this, of course, is uh, Mexico's, radiant, Mexico's radiant middle class that inhabits <laughs> this place. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that amazing intervention. Thank you, um, I don't know if we have any comments or questions from any other of the panelists or participants. But meanwhile, I thought uh, it's great, Natalia, that you're sharing these images because I think something very beautiful that happened with regards to this panel and the exhibition is that the way that Terence ended up displaying his words about Mexico is great in this mini city this like little contained you know model city of his own work um and this device that you know he created again as part of his long tradition of researching like ideas of display in museums but also of display in architecture also um allowed him to to present his own history as part of this like little urbanism of his own production I think some relationship to Mexico with this Platilolco piece is acting a little bit as anchors of this uh, little city. Yeah, they're like little toys. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like a miniature urbanism. It's like the somehow the you can orient yourself almost in the in the whole practice in this whole kind of Mexican practice as a like a city in a way. That was mm -hmm. that was a little bit the idea behind this presentation. And they're all on the same surface, which makes mm -hmm. them connected also, because they really are all very connected histories. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, although some, you know, some of the projects coming from quite different bodies of work and things, but the idea was to kind of have the viewer make the, make the connections in this very miniature, miniaturizing way. Um, they're grouped a little bit, so maybe some of the work's more about the emotional side of things or, you know, make it a little bit more together and um, mm -hmm. the functionalist works. Elsewhere, it's nice to see them scaled down, though. Also, there's like, because I I know that one in the back there, the that's like, uh, that's at Humix also, no? The, the bicycle, the bicycle exactly. building, yeah. That's like at, at a one to one. I've seen it at a one to one scale. It's kind of nice to see it. 
the V tra the V tra edition. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, the, it's like, the, like the Breton Valise. Exactly. exactly. Totally. So, Pavel, yeah. I like your I like your descri your description of the you know the non um, non functionalist aspect. I think that was that was the idea of your show. Really, it was like there you you kept going like, look at the sections; they're incredible. It's like you know there's a kind of lack of practicality in some ways and lack of function functionally in Pani's work. And I think for me, the yeah, the project was, and I think doing the wallpaper, I think you really nailed it. It was like this, this decorative like return to this to this other thing, but going through this rabbit hole of insane scale and and coming up with kind of you know, this kind of decorative or kind of theatrical result. There and there's and there's there's um, this um, this 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 decorative aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the 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 writings on on, on Mexican Mexican architecture, I think. Uh, through McCoy gets gets many of the like her her awe and her her disturbed uh, um, moment when she when she sees uh, uh, the castle uh, gets at, gets at some of this but but really it was all um, very decorative and very performative uh -huh. and it's very um, like it's very common not not so much anymore but it was very common some ten years ago that uh, architecture historians would would start their accounts of, of Mexican modernity by referring to, to European uh, models and uh, the, the radical um, desire to, to shed all forms of representation and uh -huh. their, uh, their interest their, in, 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 in making an, an, an egalitarian uh, architecture that had no class reference. Um, but really all of the, all of the Mexican uh, modernist, uh, archi well, not all of them, but, but at least Pani and, and Augusto Alvarez and, and, and some of the, the more prominent uh, um, or, or the more influential ones were very much, um, you know, they, 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 they took they, a lot of distance from that. They were not, they were not, uh, Pani, Pani had some very, very um, sharp words against uh, so-called functionalists in the, in the, in the forties. Uh, there's, there's an interview in which he's, He's, uh, he's uh, describing when he first arrived in Mexico from 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 Paris in the in the 30s. Uh, they they brought him to see a house by an architect called Pastrana. Uh, uh -huh. It was like the, the newest thing, and they were they were very excited to to show how how rational and functional it was. And 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 he recalled that his comment at that time was that that if they wanted to be completely transparent and, and non-representational, they should have made all the plumbing transparent. So you could see the shit moving through it. Uh, so, so, so he that that th that was his attitude throughout. Uh, yeah. And and um, and 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 that was the, the the attitude of many of his colleagues. They were not trying to make a, a, a non-referential uh, functionalist uh, architecture. Um, a few of them, of course, were perhaps Villagran or Gorman in some uh, context, but most of them were not. And I think that one of, one of the interesting things they achieved with this uh, with this um, attempt at, at, at representing things in, in their own terms and, and making a, 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 a Mexican a modern architectural language um, was to um, to make an, an architecture that was both an object of desire for the upper classes uh -huh. and that was also the architecture of the working class and the emergent uh, middle class. So, so one, one of the things that happens in, in Ciudad Moderna and in, in your work uh, on, on Mexico, I think it, it, it kind of shows that. It shows that this is the architecture uh, um, and, and, and the, the world in which uh, Carrillo Gil might have moved, uh, but also- yeah, of, the, of the leisured classes in a way. But also the yeah. world that, that, was, that was being built into housing projects by the government and that they have common architectural language uh, because, yeah. because they're representing, they're not, they're not simply responding to, to you know, making a solution for an architectural problem as architects at, at that time might have presented. They're, they're both, the, the architecture for the upper class, for the middle class, for the lower class is very much uh, um, interested in representing uh, a, a common destiny for Mexico, right? A, 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 a nation building project in which everybody, everybody fits, right? And I think, I think that's part of uh, the, the, the feelings that, that your works uh, uh, generate in, in Mexicans sometimes when they go like, wow, we actually had this, you know, we had Politecnico and we had Carrillo Gil and we had a, 
uh, all these Mauricio Garcés movies in this in this wonderful uh, pool, swimming pools in Acapulco. Part of what is what 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 what, what seeing this is activating is uh, is a is a recognition that there was a moment when 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 there was a shared uh, language uh, uh, in, in in architecture and in city building. Uh, you've, you, and that is very, very long gone. No, and you've, you've absolutely nailed the central thesis to really all my work on modernism in Mexico. And you could also, we could also say it's the, the public private divide again. We can go back to that idea from the beginning with, we're talking with Siqueiros with that installation um, in that, um, yeah, public architecture and the architecture work for, you know, done for the private realm. Um, that do that do kind of dovetail stylistically, even though they had completely different programs and functions and and um, and results. And it's the it's the thing that absolutely fascinated me when I arrived in Mexico and, be, and ended up being the you know the source of this big, it was a very large body of work, a lot of it which is in this show. So yeah, back to public and private again. I mean, I know I hadn't thought of it. It's funny, and originally is like I've always thought of like public architecture and then architecture for the for the wealthy or whatever. And, um, I also like how those things are often associated with the, you talked about Pani as the, as the Beaux-Arts educated, you know, the one, one, one part of the binary, you know, the, the, the leisure classes, it's like, of course, is the architects are sort of more associated more with the university and with UNAM and the architects doing more functionalist work for the public realm are, um, of course, polytechnic. Of course, people, a lot of people crossed over, but um, there's been that kind of binary that's developed as well. So those again, those two videos represent that a little bit as well. Those two, um, those two sides of that, of that thesis. And can you, can you? I don't know if someone wants to say something else. Because I have a question. I, I uh, if, 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 if I can jump in again, uh, mm -hmm. your, your work uh, on the, the wallpaper actually has um, is part of a larger body of work uh, that you worked with uh, uh, housing projects in other contexts. And, and you've also created uh, patterns and, 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 and mm -hmm. decorative uh, patterns out of them. Uh, and I, I'm curious if you've seen uh, a difference in the, in the implications that these different uh, experiments might have. So I've done, I've done a version of this piece for the, in fact, the original piece was, a, was done for New York, uh, based on a New York housing complex from the late 30s. I think it was a William Lassay's complex. I've also done a you know a body of research on Swedish housing as well, um, taking off from this from from all this work I was interested in, or as a work doing in Mexico. Um, in yeah, I mean in the U.S. in the U.S. of course it was the same the same interest in scale, um, and I've always you know through the project I've called I've, I've referred to it as symbolic scale. So it's again it's represent you know it's representing something. Um, it's not just the buildings themselves and the language and the construction language it's representing, but it's actually the, the scale of construction is also representing something. Um, what it represents is is government activism, really. It's government solving the problems of the, you know, it's, it's social engineering, it's a lot of things, but it's solving the ills of society in a way through, um, through, through these kind of massive construction schemes, as you described in Mexico in this period. Um, it's up to the viewer to you know, form their opinion. It's like, were these disastrous or what did they, did they solve some of the problems that they were, that they were designed for? I mean, as you know, aside from that, I'm just very interested in what the intentions of the, of the people who commissioned these complexes were. And of course the architects who designed them. And for me, a lot of that, I believe a lot of the intention was, was representational, was symbolic. It was actually like, let's provide housing, but it's also let's, uh, let's be seen to provide housing. Let's be to be seen to be to be engineering the new society and changing the world and improving and imp you know pre you know offering hygiene and all these things to people as well. So I'm very interested in that kind of performative aspect of the of these kind of this kind of public project at the time. So and I think the same the same the same in the other places that I've studied. And, you know, like I said in Sweden, it was about the building trades, but it was also about about like uh, it was almost like a great leap forward or, uh, you know, the, the million ton safra in Cuba or something. It's like a million, it's called the million program. It's like, we're going to build a, a million. It's a propaganda. We're going to build a million units of housing. It's a kind of propaganda move. So that was that very clearly to, to, told, talk to me about politics and, and these things is very much um, politically symbolic. 
and the same thing occurred in the U.S. I think in the 1930s, you were seeing the same kind of thing. And certainly, you see it a lot in New York, in the 30s and 40s. James, if I might be able to jump in with a question, mm -hmm. um, I was I, quite curious actually about your choice in spelling of the word neighbor. Um, did you chose to spell it with the way it's spelled in Canada, um, yeah. but the title comes from the FDR policy from the 30s of a good neighbor policy. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I mean, when I first read the title, I assumed that it would also be very connected to your work uh, with the embassies. Um, mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting to, to, to see that actually that, that body of work is, that. It's not really about that body of work, even though kind of like the good neighbor policy is about somehow U.S. presence in other states. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear you talk a little bit about your choice of, a, of on, on the wordplay, but also um, your interest in the good neighbor policy. It was um, the title was brainstormed with Julieta Gonzalez, and we we kind of came up of with course. it. Of course. Um, <laughs> and she's obviously has this like geopolitics obsession, which me as well. And and so it was it, but it was um it seemed to satisfy all these things. So it was like um my current interests and my current kind of bodies of work and things that I'm working on. Um, I like to re in in many ways re-examine the the work that we're discussing today, the you know the Mexican modernism work, in terms of of, of geopolitics more, um in terms of what was you know what was um. What were the interests of the U.S. at this point in Mexico, and what were the, um, why was you know, what could we say that modernism for the for the upper classes was a was a kind of um, was a consumerist thing? You know, was it a was was it about novelty? Was it about kind of impressing people and, and about consuming more and consuming build, building and buying more houses, et cetera, et cetera? Like, does it dovetail into into certain Western policies in that in that way. So I'm I'm re-examining a little bit, you know, this whole body of work on Mexico from from based on the research I've been doing on the on the embassies and on on, on a couple, couple, couple of projects in other countries. Um, so yes, I like the idea that it's that it's it's an umbrella. It's it's almost like a new look at this work that we're that we that we put together for the American Society show. Um, the spelling, of course, is a Canadian spelling. So. Um, we looked at a million ways of inserting my Canadianness into the title somehow, and this, and it kind of just before the book went to press, I was like, Canadian spelling. That's how we're going to do it. That's how we're going to express that. And amazingly, Karen Marta, our amazing editor, agreed, which was wonderful. Um, yeah, and if I can jump in something, Karen, something interesting also about the title is that it worked very well to to cover another aspect that we were discussing with. In throughout all these conversations, which was his positioning as a migrant artist from Canada in Mexico, this unique positioning and this unique phenomena that happened in 1990s Mexico of what Oliver de Bras dubbed the multinational underground, right? In which you had all these foreign artists like composing this super avant garde alternative scene in a new cosmopolitan scene, because at the same time, the Mexico that turns arrives to. It's a completely new metropolis changed precisely by the, by like the next wave of geopolitical happenings that were taking place in the 1980s, which is NAFTA, you know, and Terence is not just a foreigner, but he's Canadian in Mexico. So in a way, he's the ultimate NAFTA artist, or at least we've been making this show, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, this idea also, I mean, something that we were discussing a lot is how to address this in this current moment in which migration is something that has affected the imagination of so much people, how to address this positioning of being the gringo going south, right? And and and, and Terence is very much being the, the good neighbor, you know, a good neighbor in the literal sense of the world, like trying to to read a new culture in which he's coming to you through the tools that he brings from the north, but at the same time conscious of that very particular positioning that confers coming from north and not from south to north, right? I don't know if so, no, you're absolutely so that was gonna be my my an, another point. I was gonna was was um the geographic thing is extremely important. So you could one could almost develop a theory of like the condition of the neighbor. You know, I've I've lived as a neighbor really for, you know, and practiced as a neighbor for so long 
um, as somebody from next sort of next door to Mexico, as somebody sort of next door to the US, mm -hmm. sometimes I'm, you know, I'm brought to the US and we're, we're playing that with a lot, this, this, this idea of geographic identity with this exhibition in, it's like, well, let's, let's bring a, let's do a Canadian artist show, but what about a Canadian artist whose practice is in Mexico, um, bringing that to New York. So kind of confusing those things and who's, what is the neighbor and what is the neighbor to what? But um, I think my, my, you could almost say that my, you know, i the condition of my practice is, is, is the neighbor in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the body of work that I've been doing over the last 15 years is really, you know, about the, about the U S and about, you know, about the embassy program and about U S public architecture and these different, these different projects um, are very much the view I would say as a, as a foreigner, as a Canadian, as a, as the neighbor, you know, as somebody from, from the next door country who's coming in and has a, you know, knows the culture and understands it and it comes from a very, very close culture, but, but has just that amount of distance to, um, to, to form a kind of critique and analysis. Um, and I feel similar, I feel similarly about Mexico. And I think a lot of, a lot of foreign artists that have gone to Mexico see things obviously through a different, a different set of eyes. The beauty of Mexico, um, and I may have pointed to this, is, is that there was, there was interest in that vision and there's a, there's a space, you know, and there's a place in Mexico for, for those other views from outside and those other kinds of analysis. Um, I've, you know, which I've, which I've obviously experienced also in my career in Mexico. Yeah, it's nice kind to of this genuine interest in, in that, that view from the outside. Nice to think of that also in relationship to, 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 to that note from mm -hmm. that quote from Esther McCoy about, about the place, but it's really not about the place, but of, of the imagination of the, of the designer, right? Um, Absolutely. And, and in this case of the, the kind of like imagination of the artist. And honestly, like, I mean, all of these things that you're working on and all these subjects um, were also kind of like borrowing references from all over. And it was mm -hmm. that, that somehow what made it interesting that it was kind of like this, this mix and match, this random assembly of references mm -hmm. of architectural styles, but also of cultural heritage as well. This, this kind of cultural drift. It's, it's, it's been fascinating. It was one of the things, I think I talked about it in an interview with them, with um, Sarah Herda for the storefront pamphlet. Um, one of them, one of my favorite things to do in Mexico or used to be was to go to the used bookstores and find, and find books and think about how the, you, where those books were purchased and how they, I was always looking at architecture books, of course. Um, how did those books arrive in Mexico? Of course, a lot of them published in Europe. I was very interested in the, you know, architects that would go to Europe and, or the US and, um, or other countries in Latin America and, and bring back these publications and they would have a kind of influence. And this was a kind of um, cultural migration of ideas in a way that's, that's present in these actual objects in these books. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a super interesting idea. And I think we're, we're all participating in that as well as we move between countries practices in different parts of the world. And to me, those books are actual, are actual artifacts and objects of that, of that kind of, that kind of trans, you know, translated movement of ideas. Anyway, I think we, we might be reaching the limit of time and I want to thank everybody for the wonderful presentations and the great discussion. Um, we covered a lot. That, yeah. Yes, um, and I hope that you get a chance to see the show. Let's hope all of you. Um, and thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Terence, and Jose, and Tatiana, and Pablo. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you can join us. We're going to have uh, some Instagram lives coming up, published in the website with Terence in conversation with uh, other colleagues. So thank you so much. To see you guys. Take Good night. Great. Thank you. Goodbye. Gracias. Hasta luego. Bye. Bye.